A box is a mass of 8 kilograms, starts from rest at a height h. Okay, so there's our box with mass 8 kilograms and a height of h. And slides down a rough slope of length 5.9 meters. So from there it's sliding down the length of the sloping is 5.9 meters, which makes an angle of 25 degrees with the horizontal. Okay, so there's 25 degrees it makes with the horizontal slope. It undergoes a constant acceleration of magnitude 3.9 meters per second squared while sliding down the slope. The box reaches the bottom of the slope and our first question asks us to calculate the kinetic energy of the box using equations of motion. Okay, so kinetic energy is the formula. Okay, kinetic energy is a half mass times velocity squared. Now we need to calculate the kinetic energy at the bottom of the slope, which means we want the final velocity that it has when it reaches that slope. And the equation that we can use, I hope you recall, is that the future velocity squared is equal to the initial velocity squared plus 2 delta x times acceleration. Okay, how do I know I'm using this formula? Well, it's because I want future velocity, so I obviously need a formula with future velocity. I have initial velocity because they tell me it started off at rest. Okay, box starts from rest, so initial velocity is zero. I have delta x because that is the length of the slope. Okay, and I have uh, acceleration as well is given as 3.9 meters per second squared. So it seems to me like I have all I need. So I substitute 0 plus 2 times the length of the slope 5.9 meters. Okay, times my acceleration is 3.9 meters per second squared, which gives me Okay, let's use our calculator for the calculation. And there we go. 0 plus 2 times 5.9 times 3.9. 46.02. That is the velocity squared. I don't want the velocity squared. I just want velocity. Although, I actually do want velocity squared. Okay, because I want a half mass times velocity squared. And that is the correct answer. But if we were to round off and just get the velocity, maybe we will use it later on. Okay, we take the square root of that. And that can be positive or negative 6.78. Okay, we didn't choose whether upwards or downwards is positive. Okay, 6.78. Uh, 6,78 meters per second. Okay, but now using this equation, we find that kinetic energy is a half times the mass of that box, which is what? 8 kilograms. 8 kilograms times the velocity squared is 46.02 is equal to, and what do we get? 40, uh, let's put 0.5 times 8 times 46.02 gives us 184.08 184,08 joules okay next question question B asks us to calculate the work that is done on the box by the gravitational force okay now we know the work done by the gravitational force is equal to the change in the potential energy. Now usually um, you, we use negative the change in potential energy but that's if we are moving against the direction of the gravitational um, force which is down but this time it's sliding down as well so it is simply the work done by the gravitational acceleration is the change in potential energy. Okay, so uh, change in potential uh, energy is mass times gravity times the change in its height. Okay, now we don't have 
the change in the height. If we go back to the question, okay, if we go back to the question, we see that height is not known. We don't know how high it is. However, we can calculate it using our formula. Uh, as you can see, we want our opposite. We have our angle, okay, and we have our um, hypotenuse, okay, and opposite over hypotenuse is sine. So we can use sine of theta is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. Since we want the opposite side, okay, uh, we multiply both sides with h. So we see that if we take to get the opposite side, which in this case is h, we simply take, um, yeah, sorry, <laughs> the hypotenuse I've called h as well. That wasn't smart, okay. But if I want the opposite side, which in this case is h as well for height, then I take h, which is the hypotenuse in this case, and that is 5.9 times sine of 25 degrees. Okay, so that is the change in height. So I have the mass is 8 kilograms, gravity is 9.8, and the change in height would be hypotenuse of 5.9 times sine of 25. Okay, and what do we get? 8 times 9.8 times 5.9 times 25 sine. And we get 195.48. 195.48 and our answer is in joules okay now were there different methods to calculate it well of course okay the work done by gravity can also be used using the normal work in it, uh, the work formula which is the force in this case we have gravity is the force uh, times the displacement which is delta x times cos of the angle between the displacement so the displacement was down the hill and gravity was downwards so what's the angle between here and uh, sorry, the angle between the force and the displacement. Well, this one is 25, which means that one is 90 degrees minus 25, which gives me 65. 65 degrees. So another way to calculate it was 9,8 times delta x, which is the displacement, was 5.9 times cos of 65 degrees. Okay, that would give you exactly the same answer, 195.49. Now you might ask, okay, why don't you use the fact that energy before is equal to energy after? Okay, why don't we use that the, the total mechanical energy before is equal to the total mechanical energy after? Okay, uh, initial is equal to after and in the beginning we have no motion but we have all the potential energy and in the end we have no potential energy and all the kinetic energy in other words where the change in potential energy is equal to the change in kinetic energy and the answer is quite simple is that this is only true if there are no external forces no external forces. But you tell me, okay, but Peter, there is no external forces. We, we're not applying a force, okay? And I'd say yes, but we do have a rough surface. They didn't tell us I can ignore friction. There's friction involved here, and that's why when I look at my kinetic energy in the bottom of the slope, so my change in kinetic energy went from zero to this, so this is my change in kinetic energy, okay, then I see that that is not the same as that, okay, and the reason why is because some of the kinetic energy, okay, had to be used 
to overcome the external force. Actually, some, no, I'm lying, some of the potential energy was used to um, overcome the friction and therefore it wasn't all converted into kinetic energy. But uh, more about that in the next question, question C. And question C we're asked to calculate the work done on the box by the frictional force using the work energy theorem. Okay, so using work energy theorem we know. Okay, so the work energy theorem says that um, it's part and parcel of this one where the work applied gets distributed to overcoming friction. In other words, some work goes into doing friction, then in changing the potential energy, okay, and then in changing the kinetic energy. Okay, now the work applied is zero. There was no external force here. Okay, except for friction, there's no work that is being applied, no motor or uh, rope pulling on anything, so that's just zero. The work of the frictional force, that's what we're trying to work out for this question. Change in potential energy is the uh, future potential energy. Okay, potential energy in the future minus the potential energy in uh, initially plus the change in kinetic energy is of course the kinetic energy in the future minus the kinetic energy initially. Okay, so that we now see that we have, let's check it up with some color, zero. Okay, the work done by the frictional force plus. What was the potential energy in the end? Well, now it's at the bottom of the slope, so it's got no potential energy in the end, so that's zero. Minus the initial potential energy is the potential energy it had here at the top. So the change in potential energy, okay, the change in potential energy at the top it was 195.5 four nine joules. Okay, one nine five point four nine joules. Okay. One nine five point four nine joules. Wonderful. Okay. Plus and the change in kinetic energy we noticed that kinetic energy in the end was this what was it? 184.08 184.08 184.08 but initially it had no movement so when it was at the top it was released from rest and therefore that was equal to zero so what do we get? We get that the work done by the frictional force is 195.49 minus 184 4.08. What do we get? 195.49 minus 184.08 gives me 11,41 joules. That's the amount of work done by the frictional force. In other words, what was stolen. So the potential energy had the potential to change 195 joules, 195 and a half about, joules into kinetic energy, but it ended up only converting 184, okay, at the bottom. So at the bottom, the total mechanical energy was just 184,08, while at the top, the total the mechanical energy was 195.49. So what happened to it in the meantime? What happened in here in between? Well, some of the mechanical energy was converted into heat and sound and things like that. And that was done because there's friction. So there's some work done by friction or some of uh, friction dissipated some of the mechanical energy. Okay, in the second, the last question we are asked simply calculate the magnitude of the frictional force acting on the box. And that's no difficult uh, question because we know that work is equal to force times delta x times cos 
of theta okay and if we want frictional force then we just work out friction work done by friction times frictional force times change in displacement times cause of friction is always in the opposite direction so that is why these two one goes in one direction one goes in the other direction which means the angle between them is 180 degrees okay work done is 11.41 the frictional force change in displacement is 5.9 cos of 180 is negative 1 and then when we solve for F we get using our calculator 11.41 divided by 5.9 divided by 1 the negative is equal to negative 1.93 negative 1.93 newtons okay or we can instead of using the negative we can say 1.93 in the opposite direction of motion and that's it